After nearly two and a half years and a very long wait, the Elden Ring DLC is finally here. Shadow of the Erd Tree has to be, in my personal opinion, the single best piece of content from software has ever produced. And naturally, it's filled with quite a few boss fights. And quite a few very good boss fights, in my opinion, though also a few not so good bosses, or bosses that would be pretty good were it not for a few glaring issues that are reflective of some of the problems with Elden Ring on the whole. So here I am today to talk about the main bosses in Shadow of the Erd Tree. This ranking is not based on difficulty, it's based on my personal feelings about their quality and enjoyability. I'll have a few personal criteria I typically use for my rankings, but ultimately the placements on the list are determined by my own personal enjoyment of the bosses. So it's possible that a boss you quite like will be a bit lower on my list than it is on yours, and vice versa. So then, without any further ado, let's get right into this list, shall we? Starting off at number 11, we have Commander Gaius. Fuck this guy, he fucking sucks. Primarily due to the really shitty and inconsistent hitbox on his big charge that he does. It's really unclear when and where you're supposed to dodge in order to be safe. You would think if you get hit full on by the charge, you would take the most damage, but not really. It kind of seems like most of the time you take the most damage if you dodge off to the side and get caught in his tracks. It's really stupid. I know some people kind of like this boss, and there are a few mechanics and moves of his that are a bit interesting, but given that his most commonly used move is by far his most inconsistent and punishing, it makes it really hard for me to like this guy at all. So I don't. Yeah, anyway, moving on to the next one. In the number 10 spot, we have the final boss of the DLC, Ridan, Consort of Mikola. Initial reaction aside, I do think Radon's inclusion here is cool and presented an opportunity to provide a boss that fixes some of the issues with the base game's version of Radon. Namely, that he glides around a lot in a way that's kind of unnatural while on his horse and constantly seems to orbit around the player when attacking them, which makes it kind of annoying to keep track of him and really engage with the boss. Giving him, well, his legs back, and letting him move around like a relatively normal person makes it easier to engage with him like a more traditional enemy. And for his first phase, I would say that for the most part, he is a better version of the base game Radon. His moveset is very similar, in fact, he uses a lot of the same exact moves that he uses in the base game, uh, but slightly sped up, uh, maybe with a few extra parts added onto the combo. For the most part, it's pretty good. However, I do have one move of his in this phase that I take particular exception to, and that would be the light combo into cross slash attack there is no fucking dodge window for you to avoid all three of those attacks either you dodge the first one and get hit by the second or you get hit by the first and dodge the second either way it is not physically possible to dodge that full combo i have not seen it i have not seen anyone else who has found the dodge window for that combo it's bullshit other than that phase one of this boss is pretty good and then we get into phase two which is, how do I put this in most understandable terms, overtuned to hell. It's kind of what I thought Melania was when the game came out originally. So let this video be my formal apology to Melania, the Blade of Nicola. You are not actually super overtuned and unfairly difficult. Radan, consort of Mikola, on the other hand, has so much shit going on in it that it's frankly borderline impossible to even tell what's happening, and thus not very feasible to figure it out and learn how to fight the boss. It is such an insanely over-the-top challenge that it just sort of loses any fun factor found in the other notoriously difficult bosses that have come out in the Souls series. 
It's such a shame. I feel like if they just toned down a few of this boss's moves a little bit, we would have a very good boss on our hands here. One of the best. But instead, all we have is a brick wall wrapped in barbed wire that every time you walk up to it, the wall very violently falls over and crushes you to death before standing back up again and waiting for you to return to repeat the process over and over. There's very little satisfaction found in this boss. After about five hours of smashing my face into it, I summoned other players and uh, ended up encountering a hero who uh, allowed me to clear the boss. Um, I uploaded a video of my final run against the boss, so, uh, you know, go check that out if you're interested. Anyway, on to the next entry. In the number 9 spot, I have the Skadu Tree Avatar, or, as I've learned today from linguistic Twitter, the Shadu Tree Avatar, or Shadow Tree Avatar. This avatar is, fortunately, very different from the other Erd Tree Avatar and Ulcerated Tree Spirit variants we saw throughout the base game. Unfortunately, it's still quite annoying. Its moveset is just kind of a pain in the ass to deal with. It's not particularly punishing, it's just not super intuitive. I also don't understand why you kill this boss three times. Why not just give it a bigger health bar? It's not terrible, it's just incredibly mid. Moving on to the number eight spot, we have Metir, Mother of Fingers. This boss is weird. It's, it's a really weird-looking creature. It's, it's quite horrific. I was certainly flabbergasted upon initially seeing it. Um, its moveset, for the most part, is fairly basic. It's just sort of a big beast that loves to thrash around its head and its hands and its ungodly amount of fingers. Um, most of the moves are pretty easy to manage, although when it does its finger crawler crab walk towards you, that move can prove to be pretty annoying and slap happy. Then we get into its second phase, where it pinches space in between its two big fingers and creates a singularity, or a microcosm as the item descriptions call it. Uh, in this phase, it's still mostly doing the same stuff, however it does get a few big AoE spell attacks. The most notable of them being when it summons a fucking Pulsar, which is, um, not very manageable if you remain locked onto the boss, so the most effective solution to dealing with this move is just unlocking and running in the gap between the big laser and the death vortex underneath the boss that stops you attacking it from whole, this whole part of the phase. Um, outside that, the only really annoying move it has in this phase is its big cyclone spinning attack. I really just can't figure out the dodge timing for it to save my life, literally. But other than that, a pretty neat boss. In the number seven spot, I have Ramina, Saint of the Bud. I don't have too terribly much to say about this centipede scorpion lady. She's pretty neat, I suppose, but quite easy, which in this case is not really a complaint I have. She's a bit of a breath of fresh air from many of the incredibly intense, hyper-aggressive bosses that fill the roster of this DLC. A lot of her attacks can be pretty easily avoided if you just stay up next to her. She has some very forgiving dodge timings, and most of her moves aren't too difficult to avoid. All in all, just a pretty decent, fun boss that provides a bit of a breather in between presumably Mesmer at that point, or whatever other challenges you've been dealing with, and the ultimate challenge that they've unfortunately created. In the number six spot, I have the Putrescent Knight. This goop warrior is a bit of a weird one. His attacks have a lot of delays to them, but for the most part, he's fairly consistent in his delays. I don't think he does anything like Margaret does, where his attack timings will change depending on how much you're moving around him. It's just that each of his combos have a different rhythm to them that you have to get accustomed to. One of the most interesting attacks that he has is his double charge where he leaps off his horse and then his horse will be charging at you as well. That one's pretty fun to learn the dodge timing for. The only move I really don't like is the scream that the horse does. It doesn't have a very good tell and Managing to dodge it when you're up in the boss's face attacking it is, um, not fun. 
It does this big fire wave attack that may be kind of difficult to deal with until you realize it's a jumping attack, because Elden Ring really isn't good at teaching you to deal with jumping attacks. But, you know, it's not really too much of an issue once you realize you can just do that. All in all, Putrescent Knight is a bit of a weird one, but a fun weird one. In the number five spot, I have Relana, Twin Moon Knight. She, in my opinion, is a better Melania. I still like Melania a lot more than I did when I made my original ranking video way back when. But she has less mm, unforgiving moves than Melania's Waterfall Dance. In exchange, she gets combos. Combos for day. It's kind of like if Morgoth was scaled for endgame, because, oh, you are not going to be dog-walking Relana the way that you are going to dog-walk Morgoth whenever you run into him. She does so many attacks, and she does not stagger like Melania does. You can get a posture break on her eventually, but you are not going to be interrupting anything that she does, so you better get those dodge timings down to a science. Then we get to her second phase, where she turns into Pontiff Sullivan and gets a bunch more big magical attacks, which are very damaging and not very forgiving of mistakes. However, once you do get the dodge timings down for these big attacks, it's incredibly satisfying to avoid all of them. I love her big greatsword attack. I love the moonfall attack. They're such fun to avoid. Rolana is a fantastic boss, and one of my favorite regular humanoid bosses in the game. And yet, I would not consider her to be in the upper echelon of bosses for this DLC, which should be rather indicative of how much I like the bosses that we have left on this list. In the number four spot, I have the Divine Beast Dancing Lion. I guess you would call it the mascot of this DLC, if Mesmer is the poster boy. After all, it is two guys in a big animal costume, so they pretty much are a mascot. From the get-go, this is already one of the most unique and creative bosses FromSoft has ever created. Who would have ever thought of putting a Chinese lion dancing thing in a Western-style fantasy setting? I certainly wouldn't have. The music for this boss is absolutely fantastic and it very much fits the vibe of a lion dancer. And my favorite thing about it is the way that the music plays along with the rest of the fight. The first phase is fairly basic, just the lion sort of thrashing around and biting at you. Its moveset is pretty fun to deal with, however, it does suffer from one problem. The boss is a giant mass that likes to dance and cavort, and take up most of your view in the camera. And when that happens against a very unconventionally designed boss that moves in a very unnatural way, you often find yourself in a situation where it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. This becomes much more of an issue when you get to phase two, especially when they start doing the lightning part of their dance, when there is going to be lightning strikes starting to appear on the ground. And it can often be very hard to tell where lightning is going to strike, which leads to that being by far the most difficult part of the boss fight. But things fluctuate in difficulty as it flows in between the different elements during its dance, eventually reaching a third phase in which it starts rapidly switching between elements for almost every different combo. The Dancing Lion is an incredibly unique and exciting challenge, and Having fought it twice now, I absolutely love it. In the number three spot, I have Bale the Dread, who was originally my favorite boss in the DLC. I did have him ranked the highest initially, but there were a few issues I had with him. For the most part involving some issues with the camera, as is typical with big monster bosses, and some others being with not really being able to figure out when the dodge timings are for some of his attacks in the second phase. That aside, Bale is phenomenal. The 20 minute walk up to him that is the entirety of the Jagged Peak is simply fantastic. It's one of the best areas FromSoft has ever made. 
simply because no other area that they've put in their games has done such a good job at inspiring a feeling of overwhelming dread. Of just feeling like you are going somewhere you should not be. And that's exactly what a monster called Bale the Dread should inspire within you. And then you get into the actual fight, which, fortunately, learned the right lessons from the Medir fight in Dark Souls 3, giving you a big dragon boss that primarily focuses on you attacking its head. As almost every move that Bale does is going to bring his head directly up in front of you to attack and do some more damage. You combine that with a big, extravagant, exciting moveset, especially that absolutely captivating Phase 2 transition. Oh, and you add in Captain Ahab in the form of Egon. And you've got yourselves the best dragon boss FromSoft has ever made. In the number two spot, I have Midra, Lord of Frenzied Flame. Another boss who, for a time, was my favorite in the DLC. And I'll tell you why. It's because this is not an Elden Ring boss. This is a Dark Souls 3 boss. Yes, this man does have some pretty big and fairly unforgiving combos. However, he has a lot of downtime. He has a lot of attacks that can be avoided relatively easily as long as you work with positionals. He is not doing 17 attacks in 5 seconds. Most of his attacks are very well telegraphed and relatively easy to avoid. He is just a fun challenge. Not to mention the lead up to him, much like with Bale, is fantastic. The Abyss is a terrifying area. The Mance certainly feels like it's leading up to some sort of horribly hidden secret. And then you meet Midra himself, a miserable, tortured old man who very obviously isn't a regular enemy because you encounter him in a big boss arena, but the transition into the true start of his fight is uh, one of the most disgusting and shocking boss cutscenes we've had from any boss they've made seeing a guy who is pretty much you, depending on the ending that you chose when playing through the game, it was quite a shock. And battling him was a great time. One of my favorites in the entire game. Something on par with the likes of Moog and Godfrey, just in terms of how intuitive the moveset is and how fun it was to learn. However, there is one boss that goes just a little bit higher on this list. And the number one spot, my favorite boss in Shadow of the Erd Tree, is its poster boy, Mesmer the Impaler. Now, Mesmer here is actually the reason that this video is coming out when it is. I actually originally planned on recording and uploading this a few days earlier. However, I just wasn't satisfied with my experience fighting Mesmer on stream. I wanted to get progress done, I wanted to get through the DLC and didn't want to spend hours upon hours fighting a difficult boss, so I summoned. I used Mimic Tear, I summoned in Horn Scent to help me out, because we also get stuff for his quest line if you do that, and I beat Mesmer pretty quickly, definitely in under 45 minutes, and although what I saw was pretty cool, I just felt like I hadn't gotten enough out of fighting him. So I went into a different character file and played through the DLC up until getting to Mesmer and decided to fight him solo. The same thing I did when I wanted to get a better understanding of why people like Moog so much about a year or so ago. And so I spent several hours fighting Mesmer until I beat him by myself. And what was my takeaway from that? That his moveset is absolutely fantastic. It is just so much fun to learn all of the dodge timings and all of the places that you can stand in to be a little bit safer when Mesmer completes some of his combos. He's got some of the positionals that any good boss fight has. A lot of his moves are very big and over-the-top and terrifying, 
especially when he does his big spinning attack and goes into his multi-piece jab before stabbing his spear into the ground and having a bunch of them rise up out of the floor. It seems like something you need to panic roll your way out of, but it was pretty fun learning that, no, actually, you just have to dodge the spin once, and then dodge towards him once when he does the flurry, and then do a pair of dodges when he does his big stab attack, and you get yourself a big ol' opening. An opening big enough to do, like, a charged heavy attack with a colossal greatsword. It's just great fun. And then you get to Mesmer's Phase 2, with its wonderfully gross transition, and the addition of his big snakes, which... If it was much more like Rykard's fight, it probably would not have been very fun. However, there is one incredible thing when it comes to the snakes in Mesmer's Phase 2, is that Mesmer is always inside the head of the snake, meaning that you don't lose lock-on whenever he goes into this attack, and wherever the snake's head lands at the end of the attacks, that's exactly where Mesmer's going to be. And it leaves an opening for about, I don't know, two or three seconds for you to get some attacks in on him. It's just a really fun back and forth that you get with him. He was, by far, for me, the most satisfying boss to get the hang of fighting. And overall, was probably the most fun to deal with. Um, and, well, this is a list ranking the bosses based on enjoyment. And if Mesmer is the one I had the most fun with, then, well, obviously I'm going to rank him the best. Do I consider him to be the best boss in the game? Hmm, I don't know, maybe. I'm not sure. I like Godfrey quite a bit. But Mesmer is quite a bit more exciting, even if he doesn't have quite the same presence and strong emotional intensity of a giant shirtless man covered in blood screaming at you and doing wrestling moves. But by God, is he not a comparably good time to that. So, whether or not he's the best in the entire game, I'll probably have to think on for a bit, but he's most certainly a contender, and he is most certainly, in my opinion, the best boss in the DLC. But what did you guys think? If you agree or disagree with some of my rankings, be sure to share them down in the comments. One of my favorite parts of making videos like this is finding out what you guys think about it. But with that, that's all I got for today's video. If you enjoyed, be sure to check out the playlists on my channel full of other Elden Ring content. I will probably put out some more stuff in the future following up the release of this DLC. I'll see when and for what the inspiration strikes me. But until next time, I'll see you guys around. Take care.